Hello and a warm welcome to today's panel event on regulating digital and crypto finance. My name is Iris Chu. I'm director of the UCL Center for Ethics and Law. With me today is, uh, is a panel of uh, eminent speakers who will be bringing their views uh, across borders relating to the different positions that different jurisdictions are taking in relation to digital and crypto finance. Principally, we'll be discussing the Australian uh, position in terms of possible reforms, as well as the European position in relation to uh, the MICA, which is uh, proceeding through consultation and possibly uh, going to be introduced uh, in the form of law uh, not long this year. Um, I will be introducing the panel uh, and following which um, uh, the panel will be asked to speak in turn. Uh, we'll be taking questions and answers uh, on the Q&A function um, in Zoom and uh, we'll have a Q&A session only after the panel has uh, finished. Uh, so let me first introduce our speakers today. Uh, first to speak will be Professor Andrew Godwin, who is Principal Fellow at Melbourne Law School. He's also Special Counsel at the Australian Law Reform Commission. Andrew has had a long and distinguished career in both academia and practice, and a wide range of research interests in financial services law, property, insolvency law, etc. We're very pleased to have Andrew with us today to discuss the Australian reform position. Following that, we have Professor Philip Baum, who is Professor in Corporate Governance and Capital Markets Law at the Technical University of Munich. Philip is also a prolific publisher in relation to this area of law and technology and financial services, and he'll be addressing us principally in relation to the position in MICA. Following that, we'll have Nick Bertram, who is legal counsel at the Financial Conduct Authority UK. Nick is manager of the wholesale and parameter team in the general counsel's division of the FCA. Nick speaks today at a panel in his personal capacity and will be offering his reflections on what the other speakers will be talking about in relation to the reform position as well as the position in the UK. Uh, and at the conclusion of the panel, I'll be giving five minutes worth of uh, um, an, an advert break in relation to my recent book on regulating the crypto economy. Following that, we'll be taking a Q&A from the audience. And so please feel free during this time to send your questions through the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. And I'll be moderating the questions that are submitted and selecting them for the panel uh, during Q&A. So without further ado, let me first invite Andrew to speak. Well, let me start, Iris, by thanking you and the UCL Centre for Ethics and Law for inviting me to join today's panel discussion and also to kick off the discussion, as it were, with an outline of the proposed reform agenda in Australia and also my own thoughts about the direction of regulatory reform in the area of digital and crypto finance. So by way of outline, what I'd like to do is start by identifying some key questions for regulation and regulatory design in this area. Hopefully that will provide a general conceptual framework for the panel discussion. I'll then outline the current approach in Australia. Following that, I'll discuss the proposed reforms in Australia and draw some high level comparisons with the proposed crypto assets regulation, the draft EU markets in crypto assets regulation or MICA in, in the EU. And I'll conclude with some thoughts about the direction of regulation in what is obviously a very fast moving area. I think there are a number of questions that are relevant to the design of regulation. Um, and these questions that I put on the slide here are questions I think that all jurisdictions need to consider. First, a fundamental question, should the regulatory framework in respect of crypto assets, particularly private cryptocurrencies, be facilitative or prohibitive? Mainland China and India are two jurisdictions that currently fall into the latter category, although their frameworks are evolving to become facilitative in respect of central bank digital currencies. An interesting question in this regard, I think, is whether 
all jurisdictions will eventually need to be facilitative in view of the ease with which crypto assets can be created and uh, distributed across borders. Taxonomy or the way in which tokens and crypto assets are classified is also very important. Uh, I've often thought that it's very difficult to know how to regulate something if you don't know what it is. This taxonomical challenge, if you like, has become greater as a result of the pace of change that's been brought about by technological innovation. And also, I'd suggest, the extent to which new asset classes have come to be defined more by technology than by traditional concepts or labels. And uh, as we all know, this has provoked a lot of thought around how tokens and crypto assets generally should be classified for regulatory purposes. And I'll return to this theme a bit later on. The related question is targets, namely who is the target or what is the target of regulation? And a particularly important question is who should bear responsibility if something goes wrong? It's very difficult to regulate technology, of course, and so the focus inevitably shifts to regulating those who deal with the technology in some way or provide services, such as distributed ledger technology services or crypto asset services, as I think it's known under MICAR. There have been proposals in Australia to widen the regulatory net to include service providers, and I'll return to some of the proposed reforms in Australia in a moment. Fourthly, the regulatory style or method is relevant. For example, should we move away from a prescriptive rules-based approach towards a more principles-based approach in the area of crypto finance, supported by regulatory guidance, and perhaps greater discretion and flexibility on the part of regulators to formulate, interpret, and apply the rules as the market in crypto finance evolves. And I'd certainly be interested to hear Nick's views on this. A related question for regulation is whether we should aim for a unitary or bespoke regulatory framework. By unitary, I mean regulating crypto assets within the existing regulatory framework or within a single unified framework as, dis as distinct from having a separate regime or framework for crypto assets. To date, jurisdictions such as Singapore, Canada, the UK and Australia have tended to regulate crypto assets within the existing framework, although we've started to see crypto specific provisions and definitions emerging in anti-money laundering legislation and also in, in Singapore and the UK, I think uh, we've seen these crypto specific definitions and provisions emerging in uh, payments legislation. And that's primarily, I think, to attract the relevant licensing and other requirements. By contrast, jurisdictions such as Gibraltar and Malta have adopted bespoke regulations in respect of distributed ledger technology and uh, in respect of DLT providers. It's useful to note, I think, that many jurisdictions have uh, adopted a sandbox approach, which to some extent represents a bit of a halfway house between no regulation and formal regulation. A key question in all contexts, of course, is consumer protection and how to ensure adequate consumer protection. One interesting question, uh, a question I think that tends to be overlooked on occasion is the impact of the applicable regulatory model in the relevant jurisdiction. For example, is there a single market conduct and consumer protection regulator and a single rule book, as it were? Or are there multiple regulators and different rule books for different sectors or industries? And I'll speak about this further in relation to Australia in a few moments. Finally, uh, I think it's relevant to consider what, if any, regulatory objectives or philosophies might be adopted in the relevant jurisdiction. And just by way of example, uh, since the late 1990s, when the current framework in Australia was reviewed and designed 
to meet the challenges of the future. And that took place pursuant to an inquiry called the Wallace Inquiry. Australia has subscribed to the notion that there should be similar or same regulatory treatments for functionally equivalent products. And this has been a guiding principle in relation to the development of regulation in financial services for the past 25 years. A critical challenge with a functional approach, however, is how to define and assess functional equivalence for this purpose. I'll defer to Nick and Philip in relation to the position in the UK and the EU, but my understanding is that the UK has been guided by the principle of same risk, same regulatory outcome, which I think does have some attractiveness, um, but there may be a challenge, I think, in determining how to measure risk as it's applied to activities and entities. The e EU principle is similar, uh, but perhaps reflects a more activities-based approach. And I think that also has some attractiveness, but it does require clarity around the classification of activities or crypto assets. And I think that's been a bit of a, or the subject of debate in recent times in relation to the scope of MICA and what exactly it covers. It's also important to consider the relevance of general regulatory principles, such as the need for regulation to be technology neutral. In other words, not to favor one technology over another. To date, uh, in Australia, we haven't really seen a lot of regulation as it applies to the use of technology itself. Although we have seen quite a bit of regulatory guidance in areas where we have uh, technology in intensive services, such as robo advice. And I might mention while I'm at it that uh, regulation isn't the only area in which um, we're seeing challenges, as many of us would be aware. Many challenges arise in the realm of private law. For example, how should crypto assets be classified from a property law or proprietary, proprietary perspective? And how should they be treated in the event of insolvency on the part of a crypto exchange? Something that's been very topical in Australia as I'm sure it's been in other jurisdictions. So in the, in the flyer for today's webinar, Iris made a very interesting and I think thought provoking observation. And I quote, the Australian reform agenda appears to be holistic in nature, covering the business aspects of blockchain based commerce, as well as crypto assets and finance. The European proposal in the form of MICA seems more limited. It's still early days in Australia in relation to regulatory reform in the area of crypto finance. And I wouldn't suggest at all that Australia should serve as a model for other jurisdictions. But as I was reflecting on Iris's interesting observation, it occurred to me that to some extent, a holistic approach is if you like, predestined or predetermined in Australia as a result of our functional approach to regulating financial products. And also, I'd suggest the uh, functional regulatory or supervisory model that we adopt in Australia, namely the Twin Peaks model, where we have a single market conduct regulator for financial services, namely the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, I do think that our functional approach to regulating financial products and to financial supervision generally creates a certain path dependency that demands a holistic approach to reform. One of the benefits of a functional approach, I think, is that it recognises the challenges in designing regulation by reference to labels as distinct from the function of a particular product or activity. The functional nature of the definition of financial product in the Corporations Act means that if crypto assets or tokens function as financial products under any of the three categories that you see on the slide here, it will be regulated, these assets or tokens will be regulated as financial products and attract the licensing and disclosure requirements. And so in effect, we define financial products by reference to um, each of these three functions, making a financial investment, managing financial risk, or making non-cash payments. And there are specific provisions in the Corporations Act, Chapter 7, 
that explain what each of these functions is all about. ASIC, our regulator, has noted that the application of regulation is based on the rights and features of each individual crypto asset. A recent uh, Senate committee that examined reforms to the regulation of crypto assets suggested that this functional approach can cause uncertainty and that it's a policy matter for government whether or not there should be clarity on the issue. And the critical question, of course, is how might regulatory clarity be provided? It's interesting if you compare Australia with certain other jurisdictions, uh, many other jurisdictions rely on exhaustive lists of financial products or services, even though some of the categories might be somewhat open-ended. Australia appears to be quite unique in relying on a broad functional definition of financial product, uh, a point that was explored by the Australian Law Reform Commission in its current review into the simplification of corporations and financial services regulation in Australia. So, um, as I mentioned before, Australia adopts a functional approach to regulation and supervision in terms of having a single market conduct regulator and a single prudential regulator uh, in, in, in the form of the Australian Prudential Regulatory or Regulation Authority, APRA. A Twin Peaks model was adopted in the UK in 2012, uh, but uh, as Nick will be aware, that's by no means a replica of the model that was pioneered in Australia back in the late 1990s. Some have commented on the extent to which the Twin Peaks model is more effective in accommodating technological evolution than models that are based on institutional or sec sectoral models. And with apologies for the self-promotion, if Iris can do it, I can do it as well. I've included on this slide an extract or a quote from a book that I co-edited that was recently published on the Twin Peaks model of financial regulation which makes this point in relation to Hong Kong. What's interesting about the Twin Peaks model is that it requires effective coordination between the financial regulators in order to make the model work. And I've often thought that one of the benefits of this model is that each regulator recognizes the need to coordinate with the other regulator for the reason that it wouldn't be able to perform its regulatory functions effectively or properly without having robust effective coordination arrangements in place with the other regulator. If you like, each regulator has a vested interest in ensuring that the other regulator succeeds. Of course, in the area of crypto assets, at least in Australia, coordination is necessary not just between the Twin Peaks peak regulators, but between the Twin Peak regulators and a number of other regulators, such as the Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia, in respect of the payment system and Austrac, which is the uh, regulator in the area of AML, anti-money laundering. But I think irrespective of the model, coordination between regulators in this uh, fast growing area is, is of critical importance to avoid inconsistencies and confusion. And one thinks of the uh, initial debate, uh, which to some extent is ongoing in the US about whether cryptocurrencies should be regulated as securities or commodities as an example of some of the um, uncertainty that can arise. So what are the proposed reforms in Australia? I've listed on this slide three significant reviews or inquiries that are relevant in the area of crypto assets. The first two have already been completed. The third in which I'm involved is ongoing. The first one, the Treasury Review, which reported in June 2021, focused on the payment system and how it should be reformed to accommodate new technologies, new business models, and new forms of money. The Senate Select Committee focused on reforms in Australia's technology, finance and digital assets industries, and reforms in the regulation of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. The current ALRC inquiry focuses on how to simplify and rationalize the legislative framework in respect of corporations and financial services, including uh, how it might be adapted uh, in order to accommodate new business models, technologies, and practices. 
So as you can see, there's quite a bit of overlap between these three reviews. On this slide, I've set out some of the recommendations from the payments system review. Notably, I think it recommends powers on the part of the responsible minister, the treasurer, to designate payment systems and participants for regulatory purposes and to direct regulators to develop regulatory rules accordingly. It also recommends a functional approach in terms of the regulation of payments and that's to ensure that the system remains fit for purpose as technological advancements gather pace. And it also recommends that coordination between the regulators be improved. Let me now just outline some of the recommendations in relation to the, um, or under the Senate Select Committee review on Australia as a technology centre. Key recommendations are set out on this slide. They include the recommendation that a token mapping exercise be conducted to determine the best way to characterize the various types of digital uh, asset tokens in Australia. And also a recommendation that a new decentralized autonomous organization company structure be established. Now the government has agreed to all of these recommendations in principle, Although I note that in relation to recommendation four, Treasury agreed to commence consultation on, quote, an appropriate regulatory structure for these decentralized autonomous organizations, leaving open the possibility that an alternative to the company structure might ultimately be adopted. I think uh, Philip might be touching on decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs in his comments. Of course, I'll defer to Philip on the details concerning MICA, including whether the correct acronym is MICA or MICAR. But it appears to me that uh, MICA represents a more bespoke approach to the regulation of tokens as compared with the proposed reforms in Australia, with, uh, I understand, utility tokens and stable coins being regulated separately from investment and securities tokens. A key issue I understand in this regard, and one that's being uh, subject to some debate at the moment is, is the current difficulty in drawing the lines, drawing lines between the different types of token and the challenges that this might create for, uh, or in terms of regulatory arbitrage. Let me finish with just some concluding uh, thoughts about what all of this suggests in terms of the direction of reform going forward. First, at least in Australia, I think the impact of technology will result in a move away from the current prescriptive rules-based approach that we have in favour of a more principles-based approach, one that importantly is supported by clear outcomes. And the UK is an interesting, interesting jurisdiction in this regard because it has experimented a lot with outcomes-based regulation. And I'd be interested to know to what extent this might um, be relevant in the context of crypto assets. Secondly, I think the regulatory net will need to uh, widen to include a broader range of parties, including providers of technology-related services, as I, as I mentioned before. And this point was recognized in the payment system review report in Australia in relation to providers of payment facilitation services. Thirdly, I think it's inevitable that regulators will need to be given greater powers and flexibility to adapt to challenges brought about by technology and will also need greater regulatory discretion in order to achieve that uh, often, um, uh, what's the right word, um, uh, difficult balance between uh, achieving adequate consumer protection and at the same time, not stifling innovation. And I'd be interested to hear Nick's views on that from a UK perspective and Philip's too from an EU perspective. Lastly, I think it'll be interesting to see where things land in terms of this question of whether a unitary or bespoke regulatory framework is appropriate. I think this depends on a number of factors, including the regulatory model, as I mentioned, and also on the regulatory philosophy that underpins regulation in this area. 
Iris, that's all I was proposing to say uh, by way of my comments. Um, let me hand the floor back to you. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from, from Philip, uh, Nick and yourself. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, for this. Um, I, I very much like uh, the, the, the Senate's reform proposals, actually, but I think it's a very difficult choice between the unitary approach and, uh, and a bespoke approach. Um, without further ado, let me invite Philip to the floor uh, to talk about Bika. Okay, good. So I'm unmuted. So I'm assuming you can hear me and you can also see my slides. If that's not the case, then please uh, give me a sign. So yeah, thanks. Um, everyone, thanks in particular to Iris and Andrew for uh, the first very, very interesting presentation. So let's see um, how this compares to the European Union framework. So the first thing, um, it is always difficult to compare regulatory approaches because uh, on the one hand, you have the theoretical approaches. On the other hand, you have the different codes, let's say, of regulation. So what we actually need to do is to find the different elements. And um, if we take a look at what's happening in the European Union right now, I mean, there are a lot of criticisms on the European Union and one of them, and it's a valid one, is uh, that the European Union is not exactly quick when it comes to lawmaking for various reasons. I have to say, when it comes to the whole digitization, uh, there's a huge typo, I'm just realizing agenda, we can see uh, quite a few things here. So um, about one and a half years ago, we had the first uh, two major projects about crowdfunding and the DORA regulation, which is basically about uh, digital resilience for financial service providers and similar entities. What we have in the pipeline right now is the digital services and the digital markets Act. This is basically about uh, digital platforms such as Facebook and the like, which I very, very well, let's say, I was a little optimistic here, say might pass parliament in 2022. We have a regulation on artificial intelligence um, in the pipeline. It really remains to be seen uh, what happens there, but they claim that it is actually the first, let's say, um, holistic maybe approach to regulating artificial intelligence. Then we come to the red area, and this is actually where we find the parallels to what Andrew spoke about. So we have the digital euro, so the digital currency, central bank currency, which is expressly not a part of Mika, but of course the two packets or the two approaches can't really be, be separated from each other. Then we have a pilot regime for DLT market infrastructures, which is sometimes seen like a little bit like a bandwagon or like see a sidecar for the whole um, Mika approach, because as we know it, if we talk about financial products, if we talk about markets, then we have to have functioning market infrastructures as well. And so this is um, the DLT regime. Um, it is uh, combines certain elements, but it basically seeks to uh, come up with a market infrastructure for DLT based um, tokens and the like. And, and it also includes features such as um, a regulatory sandbox, at least that is the plan. But however, Mika stands at least formally separate from these others. So what was the story so far? Um, one of the big, big debates over the last, say, four years was, oh, do all these different token archetypes, mm, do they fall under European Union regulation? So are they subject in particular to the MIFID II directive? Why is that so important? Well, that's actually quite simple. simple. Um, the MIFID directive is a little bit like, you might call, call it the constitution of financial markets laws in, in Europe. In particular, it contains the pivotal definitions. So as soon as so, some kind of financial, let me call it product, um, is called by MIFID, then we could say the full brunt of European Union regulation applies. And so the question was, is Bitcoin financial product? Is it a financial instrument um, or not? And what about the other archetypes? And if we take a look at the definition in article four, one, um, number 44 it actually is, the key term is transferable securities and transferable securities means those classes of securities it's a little circular there, which are negotiable on the capital market with the exception of instruments of payment, such as, I'm, and I'm shorting things down here, shares, bond, 
or any other securities giving the right to acquire or sell any such transferable securities. So the focus here was much more on transfer and trade than in investment. And all of a sudden, the, the whole story had becomes, or so we received a kind of a different spin. And the result after quite a few debates and articles um, was that what we usually refer to as investment tokens or security tokens would be considered transferable securities. However, bitcoins, for example, or utility tokens would not. And that leads to a very, very weird situation. You might say investment tokens are subject to the full force of European Union regulation because they're trans uh, securities, so they are treated like shares, whereas the rest of the token world is not. So we have a huge problem with regulatory arbitrage here at this point. Some member states mitigated that to a certain extent. So for example, the German regulator said, uh, we take the view that, for example, bitcoins are units of account and therefore we apply the German equivalent of the European rules. But that was only like, like a patchwork solution. So not many regulators did that. Yeah. Okay, so that is the background. What was the plan now under Mika? Let me first um, just explain where we are right now. So the uh, original commission draft is from September 2020. And if I talk about Mika now, I'm always referring to this original draft. There are now some, some not counter proposals, but some suggested amendments on the table because the current status is uh, what we call under European Union law, it's complicated, the so called trilogue which basically means all the major stakeholders in, um, in uh, European Union lawmaking, which is the Commission, Parliament, and the Council, um, have said their piece, and now the suggestions lie on the table, and now they need to come to a uh, conclusion. And this is supposed, or that's the plan, to be the case by the end of 2022. So, my insiders say, look, we'll probably know by the second half of this year what the final text will be. And um, then we'll pro it will probably be published in the official journal end of 2022. And then most likely it will come into force in January 2024. However, there might still be hiccups. Um, maybe you've, you've heard of something about that over the last two or three weeks. Uh, the most important subcommittee in the or committee in the European Parliament had the very, very funny idea to essentially ban all services, to make them illegal, if they refer to unsustainable proof of work um, consensus mechanisms, which basically means it's pretty much illegal to run any kind of services relating to Bitcoin and the like. And um, there was quite a bit of upheaval. And in the end, this suggestion was voted down. And all of a sudden, it became very political between the parties to really say who's in which camp. However, this suggestion is now off the table, but it demonstrates that it's still a long way to go. So what is now the idea of Mika? So the idea is it will, or it's supposed to be a one-stop shop for all crypto assets in the EU. And what they've actually done to do this was they've taken existing pieces of EU legislation and regulation and put it into Mika and customized it. And they made some firm further amendments by putting in just a tiny few very, let's say, crypto specific rules. So you could say, and um, the great one stop shop is, in the starting point, some patchwork of existing regulation. But formally, it's a one stop shop. A second <coughs> major issue uh, was, of course, the emergence of payment systems and the like. Um, uh, planned by big tech, so in particular, the Facebook payment system. So this is the second main, let's say, um, approach to Mika because European Parliament or the European regulators expressly wanted to create a counterweight or something to balance uh, or tackle the problems that could arise if uh, big technology companies issue tokens, uh, in particular, payment tokens. Importantly, Mika, and this could be considered as slightly ambitious, takes a global approach. So Mika wants to regulate basically all kinds of tokens if they are issued in the European Union or traded in the European Union. 
And of course, this might, at the end, cause some friction because you might come to the point that you have double or triple regulation regarding basically the same issue. And as I already said, it will have this by wagon with the pilot regime. So that's, these are the basic ideas. You can see it's already quite a few ideas together. So the big legal question is, of course, well, what are the tokens covered by Mika? And this is defined in Article 3, uh, Subsection 1. A crypto asset means a digital representation of value or rights which may be transferred and stored electronically using distributed ledger technology or similar technology. So they took a bit of the back door here. So they have specific regulation for blockchain and DLT. However, they made it kind of technology neutral as well by saying, yeah, yeah, similar technology is also something that should be covered. What that could exactly be, I don't know yet, but we'll see what the future might bring. So this is clear from um, the whole process that the basic crypto asset that is meant here is what we would refer to as currency tokens and uh, in particular the Bitcoin. However, Mika also introduces specific categories here. For example, the asset referenced token. So um, tokens that have an underlying asset or a multitude of fiat currencies, so not just one, but a multitude. Second subcategory <coughs> is e-money tokens, which have by definition only one underlying um, currency. And the third one is the utility token. And all of them come with fewer or maybe more numerous specific rules. What is not covered is, as I said earlier, the security token. So Mika said, expressly says, yeah, well, as, as Andrew already outlined, things will stay the same. If something is a security, then it will remain regulated under securities laws, which gives you a little bit of an idea. So mm, there is substance to the argument that the lawmakers actually see the classical financial markets regulation as, let's say, more rigid or more important, maybe. And the Mika, let's say, as I wouldn't call it a subsidiary, subsidiary regime, but something that is maybe not on the same level. And this, of course, creates arbitrage again. What is not covered either are payment services as such. Payment services are and will be regulated under the Payment Services Directive, or to be, or be, uh, to be more precise, the second Payment Services Directive from 2016. However, of course, quite a few elements in Mika also refer to payments. So for example, currency tokens, obviously, or e-money tokens, both have, of course, a very, very strong flavor of payment services law. So we have a bit of an overlap here, which might become uh, interesting in the near future. And um, since it's a bit of a hype right now, what uh, there's still the, the pundits are arguing, but apparently uh, NFTs will not be regulated under Mika either. The new concept introduced by Mika are the so-called significant tokens. And here we have a completely new spin because now we have the idea of prudential regulation. So what Mika is doing, it says, if um, e-money tokens or asset reference tokens um, become significant, then they are not regulated by the national competent authorities like the Spanish or the German or the Italian one, but they become subject to a regime, additional uh, requirements supervised and administered by the European banking authority. So all of a sudden we have banking law elements in Mika. The criteria, they are different and um, they will change over the next month, we can be absolutely sure. It's basically about how big is the customer base, how many tokens are there and so on and so on and so on. But this is a direct, let's say, answer to the uh, big tech movement. What they basically wanted to do is they wanted to impose some kind of banking rules um, on big tech, in particular Facebook. And as I understand it, it's not a surprise or it doesn't come really as a surprise that Facebook um, buried their first uh, project to issue an own token when the first draft of Mika was released. Yeah? In Europe, we have a bit of a tendency to underestimate how much impact our regulation can have. Uh, we see the same right now in the competition field. Okay, so that's the significant tokens. And what is the rest? Well, it's a 
network, as I said. So for normal tokens, so who are not e-money and not asset-backed, we'll have a disclosure regime. So we'll have uh, to disclose uh, all important information, not in a prospectus, but in a white paper. And the Mika even uses the term white paper, which is clearly drafted according to the EU prospectus um, uh, regulation and then tweaked a little bit. For <coughs> asset-backed tokens and e-money tokens, there will be an authorization regime. So these offering asset-backed tokens or e-money tokens will be treated more like providing financial services and not like issuing securities. This is also something relatively new. What <coughs> Mika will also do is it will provide another authorization regime for the so-called crypto asset services. So what they basically did here was they took the MIFID framework for financial services and copied it into the Mika and made it a little more crypto specific. Plus they added two new kinds of crypto services. They added the custody and the operation of crypto platforms, forms and exchange services. And that leads to, again, to kind of an interesting question. What happens if you offer certain financial services regarding normal transferable securities, maybe also security tokens or investment tokens? But on the other hand, you also provide services regarding, um, regarding uh, crypto tokens. Because as soon as you have one, say, financial service provider, financial advisor, maybe a trading platform, you said all of a sudden have two different regimes to comply with. I have a bit of a feeling that this was not really thought through at that point. And finally, what they also did, they also included the whole European Union regime on market abuse practices. So market manipulation, prohibition of insider trading, continuous disclosure, and so on and so on, and imposed it on um, all kinds of uh, tokens Again, with the exception of security tokens, but they are already caught by the market abuse regulation. I'm currently putting together a group of authors for a commentary and finding authors to call, cover all these different areas, believe me, is actually a rather complicated business. So now if I want to stay within the 15 to 20 minutes framework, I've borrowed um, Andrew's slide about this, um, the Senate committee recommendations. And if we now look for the specific things that they said is they wanted to um, implement a market licensing regime for digital currency exchanges. We have that either through MIFID or soon via Mika. A custody or depository regime for digital assets with minimum standards to be established. We have that as well. We have the new uh, custody service regulated under Mika. Third one, a token mapping exercise to be conducted to determine the best way to characterize the various types of digital asset tokens in Australia. Yeah, we kind of did that as well. Um, although our system doesn't really allow for a lot of flexibility. So our system is relatively rigid, which comes with certain advantages and certain disadvantages. So you might, <clears throat> the problem is a little bit, as soon as new important token types emerge, that we might, and we might not be able to, to, to cover them with the, existing, with the existing definitions, for example, NFT, well, European Union lawmaking is rather sluggish. So there will be certain mechanisms in place in Mika so that uh, the European Commission can um, issue uh, delegated regulations in certain areas. There will be um, technical standards issued by, I think by ESMA and the EBA. However, the core definitions are still relatively rigid. So we do have that, but we do not have the intended flexibility that uh, Andrew mentioned. <clears throat> the Treasury lead a policy review of the viability of a retail central bank digital currency. We have that as well, although, as I said at the very beginning, not under the Mika regime, but it's a separate issue. By the way, so the German, uh, sorry, the European Union expressly says um, digital currency and decentralization, these are things that can go together, but they are not necessarily part of the same package. So we have an overlap, but it's not exactly the same. And then the last one, if we take a look, a new decentralized autonomous organization company structured to be established. And we don't find anything about that. So 
we wonder why. Um, my guess, it's an educated guess, but it's still a guess, is, well, the European Union doesn't really have the lawmaking power there. The DAO would necessarily cover the, uh, go into the area of, on the one hand, financial services, financial products, and so on, but definitely also in the, in the field of company law. And here, the lawmaking power laws lies with the member states, and you need a very, very high level of consensus um, to enact legislation in that area. And we've seen various legislative uh, proposals over the last uh, 10, 15 years that have basically been shelved because uh, people or the companies, or sorry, the member states couldn't agree on them. So from that angle, I would be interested what Nick says about that, because the usual counterparts were the UK and Germany, who couldn't agree in the area of, of company law. Uh, but as we all know, the situation has changed uh, over the last years. Um, so maybe there's a difference there. We also have to keep in mind that um, in the European Union, the whole fintech area, but also the capital markets union, these are big political projects. So there is, uh, there's a prioritization here. Company law is not. So now I can only speak from a German perspective. I can really sense how reluctant governments are to implement blockchain technology into the statutory law and then implementing a D and DAO, which is basically forgetting some of the absolute basic principles of company law that we've gone, grown accustomed to over the last 100 years is a big one. And then doing that on the European level, mm, Let's just say I would find it very interesting if Australia goes ahead. So just that we have a bit of a model example as in what Europe might be willing to do in five years. And that was the European Union meetup perspective. Um, so now I'm happy to hear comments from, I think it's Nick's turn now. And thank you a lot. And thanks a lot. And waiting for your questions later on. Thank you, thank you, Philip, for this um, wonderful overview of Mika and, and whatever shape I think the ultimate text takes, this will be a pioneering template, you know, that uh, everyone else will study. Um, with that, shall I call upon Nick for your comments? Great. No, thank you very much, Harris. And really interesting to hear from Andrew and Philippe there. I mean, there was a lot there that actually really resonated with me um, as a practitioner, if you like, in, in, in the regulator. I should just remind everyone I'm speaking in the personal capacity here rather than speaking for the FCA. But there are a few things I want to pick up on, actually. Um, Firstly, um, to deal with this overall point about what we call in the FCA, what I call the perimeter of regulation, i.e. how are these crypto assets caught within existing structures of regulation because that's something that we at the fca have been grappling with since uh basically since crypto assets first came across my desk in the legal department back in 2014 2015. you know do and it, it was really interesting to hear andrew and uh, philip's perspectives on this but and, and we've had exactly the same thing you know looking at a crypto asset your typical crypto asset does it fall within any of the particular categories of a regulated investment that then bring it within uh, the regulatory perimeter. Now, for the most part, at the moment as we speak, generally speaking, no, a crypto asset in itself, uh, such as a Bitcoin, EFA, whatever it might be, is outside the, peri the authorization perimeter of uh, uh, the FCA. Now, obviously, our regulation is developing now, and, and uh, crypto assets are steadily coming more into the regulatory scope uh, of the FCA uh, uh, for, for, for particular aspects, and I'll talk about them in a bit. But one thing to talk about the perimeter here, and it'll lead on to one of the, the, the very good points that Andrew raised about uh, uh, the flexibility of regulators here. Um, Looking at the perimeter aspect, one thing I think is, is, is important not to lose sight of is that you have the crypto assets in themselves, which generally speaking, won't be regulated products in the UK at the moment. Some might be if they have the characteristics of a typical security. And we have seen crypto assets that are, are very much like transferable securities in MIFID. They have exactly the same characteristics as a share or a bond. We would say they would be within our perimeter. So activities would be regulated in respect to them. But obviously you have large categories of crypto assets which are completely outside of scope. That being said, there are of course products which are developed 
off crypto assets, be it derivatives that reference crypto assets, which are certainly capable of being uh, uh, regulated products in the UK. And indeed, we've taken action to, uh, and the FCA has taken action to uh, ban the marketing and sale of such products because of their inherent risks to uh, retail customers. Quite, quite a controversial policy, that one. Um, but also what we've seen a lot of recently, and you know, people who have been reading the financial press will have seen this too, are things like crypto deposit and lending arrangements, whereby you can leverage, you hold, you hold crypto assets, but you can leverage off your, your uh, investment in cryptos, if you like, to get a return by, if you like, pledging them to uh, 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 a body, whoever it might be, a crypto exchange or, or, or another firm that will then use those crypto assets in its business and give you a return. Now, these, some of those arrangements start to look very much like investment vehicles or collective investment vehicles in, 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 in the UK speak, um, which can raise a lot of interesting and very challenging perimeter issues. And it's interesting seeing Andrew's quote that he had in his slides from um, I think it was the Australian Senate Select Committee um, that basically needs to be dealt with on a case by case ba basis, whether a crypto asset or something relating to a crypto asset uh, falls within the perimeter, if you like, of regulation. And we're certainly finding that with these uh, crypto lending and deposit schemes and staking schemes as well. That's another aspect where you can sort of generate a return from your holding of crypto assets. So I think it's quite important for, for us as regulators and practitioners not to lose sight of that. You know, we can get quite focused on the crypto assets themselves and how they should be regulated or not regulated, depending on, 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 on what they are. But we also need to be conscious of those products that or those arrangements that use crypto assets and could create you know, risks themselves uh, to consumers. I mean, that's one of my personal concerns. Like, you know, what if these crypto lending and deposit arrangements go wrong? You know, um, uh, what happens to you? You've, you've, uh, uh, you, you've, you believe you held these crypto assets. You then gave them, for lack of a better word, to uh, or deposited them uh, with uh, another firm that then used them. That firm goes bust, let's say. What happens to your crypto asset? Is, is there any disruption for you? Maybe you get it back and it's absolutely fine. Maybe you don't. It sort of disappears into ether. We, 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 we just don't know. You know, I mean, that's, that, that'll be an interesting to see how, how that, that progresses. And it's interesting to see in the US, the SEC and uh, some of the state regulators have taken quite a robust approach to these arrangements to say, look, these types of things are security arrangements and should be regulated as securities. So that, that, that's quite, quite, quite an interesting aspect. And that gets on to, to my point that actually Andrew quite rightly raised and, and Philippe too, about the flexibility of regulators themselves to kind of deal with the regulation of these products. Now, as many of you who, who, who know the, 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 the UK system of regulation, it's obviously the treasury, the government essentially, that sets the perimeter of regulation. It sets the activities and the investments uh, that are to be regulated by uh, the FCA or the Bank of England. Uh, and that's kind of set out in legislation in effect. And it's a really interesting point that, 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 that Andrew raised about, uh, well, look, going forward, what sort of flexibility should regulators have? Because at the moment, as we're sort of moving into the kind of post-Brexit world for uh, the UK, um, there's quite a drive from the government to Kind of, if you like, God, I don't want to use Boris's uh, expression, take back control, but it's almost like that, the sort of political justification of it, to kind of give the powers back to the regulators that used to be with the European authorities or the Commission. So obviously, in the immediate aftermath of Brexit, we had a big job onshoring the various bits of EU regulation uh, into UK law effectively statute and now the ne for, for, for the next stage which is going to take a number of years is to kind of pass those 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 powers or that authority down to the regulator um now i don't know where this will end up with something like as, as, as crypto assets i think it's, it, it, it's obviously a lot broader than that but there is a question about you know to what extent uh, the regulators be it the bank of england or be it the fca 
should have kind of scope to set the activities that they regulate. And that raises some quite fundamental questions, I think, about accountability as well, actually. So there could be quite a lot of tension, uh, you know, from uh, a political tension, actually, in terms of how, how Parliament would see this, actually, and how the market might see this, you know, uh, uh, at, at the moment, you know, obviously, to, to, to make changes to the perimeter, it needs to go through a legislative process. Uh, if that power was, say, transferred down to the, 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 the regulator, um, you know, what, what, what accountability is there for, 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 for the regulator, particularly considering that actually there are criminal sanctions for breaching the perimeter. So that, 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 that's one interesting question. I mean, I just sort of put, 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 put that out there. But obviously, uh, regulators do have the ability to set their own rules as well. The FCA has quite broad rulemaking powers. Now, obviously, that tends to uh, just sort of work in terms of stuff that's within our existing perimeter. So we're still uh, if you like, uh, that's still set set by the Treasury. So that that's that's you know one 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 interesting resonance that I had there from from what Andrew and and, and Philip were talking about as well. I mean, just to say a few words about the UK approach up to now, I will say up to now, because obviously it is it is developing. I mean, the UK approach seems to have been a lot more piecemeal, I would say, than the Australian approach and indeed the European approach. So we, we, we don't have anything yet like Mika. We don't have anything yet like the kind of the, the, the Australian proposals. The way crypto asset regulation has kind of developed over the past few years has been in particular bits, particular chunks, if you like. Um, so you know, obviously, you had the money laundering regime under the money laundering uh, uh, regulation, ultimately, uh, which has been expanded to cover uh, crypto, certain types of crypto asset business. So that's kind of brought it not not within our authorization perimeter as such, although, you know, increasingly now crypto firms have to be registered with the FCA. But the MLR regime, of course, is, is, is limited to effectively financial crime, mon mon money laundering issues. It's not a full on regulatory regime. But you can see it's starting to you know that, that 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 the crypto world is starting to get more within the purview of of, of the FCA, if you like, and, and and the regulators. And then, of course, you have the proposals that are still proposals at this stage. Um, you know, you have the uh, extension of uh, the prime financial promotions regime uh, to cover uh, crypto assets business. Um, and the FCA issued its consultation on the rules, the financial promotion rules that will will apply. Now, that's quite quite different actually, because you 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 then have the sort of financial promotions regime, which is broader than the authorization regime Gen generally you know in the past the financial promotions regime has pretty much closely tracked um the, the the wider fca authorization regime so you know if you're dealing in a regulated product you're providing a regulated activity uh, the financial promotion regime applies now going forward i mean once a, once the treasury has put the legislation in place which is still um still i think it's still to be laid in parliament actually the 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 the, the amendments to the financial promotions order you will have a situation where you have uh, certain types of, if you like, unregulated crypto business that will be covered by the financial promotions regime. And that's to reflect the particular risks that we've seen in terms of, uh, you know, poor quality, misleading promotions being issued, which would encourage people to invest in, in, in potentially risky crisp, uh, crypto, crypto products. And you can read the, 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 the CP to see the, the types of requirements we're thinking of putting in place. I mean, we're not going to ban uh, uh, crypto promotions, uh, but we are going to impose certain rules and requirements around them, such as uh, particular risk warnings that need to be given, uh, appropriateness tests as well, uh, and other types of disclosures and restrictions on who they can actually be promoted to. So you've got the financial promotions pillar, if you like, as, as, as it was, or step, stepping stone, if you like. And then, of course, you have uh, the stable coins uh, uh, consultation that the Treasury issued at the beginning of last year. So, again, sort of diff interesting to compare uh, the different approaches in, in Australia uh, and the EU to this. Now, obviously, uh, Philippe mentioned that uh, Mika has certain aspects about the payments side. I think, Andrew, you mentioned also that the Australian system has certain, you know, focus on, on, on the payments side. Um, I didn't hear anyone mentioning stable coins. And I started, maybe this is a slight difference for, for, for the UK in that the focus of that particular Treasury proposal uh, to bring stable coins or, or activities related to stable coins within regulation is focused on, on stable coins, i.e. Uh, crypto assets that are pegged 
to, if you like, to a uh, 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 to either commodities or more likely fiat currency. And I suppose it was interesting uh, when Philippe mentioned the the uh, Facebook. Uh, and yes, thank you, thank you, Philippe. Uh, it was interesting that Philippe mentioned the, the 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 Facebook proposals, which I think were quite a driver for the Treasury back in 2020, 2021, to actually, you know. Uh, advance uh, this particular work in times of, uh, for stable coins, because then at the time there was concern about Facebook introducing uh, its own particular stable coin, which may have, became, may have become very, very large. Now, as we know, that didn't happen or hasn't happened yet. Um, but it's interesting comparing uh, the, 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 the Mika approach, uh, where Philippe mentioned that actually there could be some types of systemic or more systemic uh, crypto assets that would be kind of similar to be regulated under, under effectively banking regulation, and that's what you have with uh, the Treasury stablecoin proposals, which obviously still at, you know are, are, are just consultation proposals at the moment. Consultation has closed, so we don't know what the the, the, the final uh, regime is going to look like. But obviously there was uh, mention there about if there was more a, a more systemic stablecoin, um, uh, then that might be subject to kind of more subject to regulation under the Bank of England because of the the, the, the systemic implications. So it's interesting to see that that that, that you know that that you could if you like uh, quite a lot of the focus on crypto assets has quite rightly been on uh, the risks to consumers, consumer protection, which is obviously for the FCA. But also as these things get bigger, particularly with a stable coin that might be used as a means of payment and might kind of challenge uh, um, uh, fiat currencies. Um, that has various systemic implications. So uh, that's where the Bank of England will have a lot more of an interest. And obviously, we are working very closely uh, with our colleagues in the Bank of England and the Treasury, of course, to, to, to help sort of develop uh, the, uh, uh, the, if you like, the, the, the where where the framework might go for, for for crypto asset regulation in the UK. I mean, I think speaking personally, I think over time the UK will probably end up in a place that won't be a million miles away from Australia uh, and indeed the EU. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we have to be very conscious that, as both Andrew and Philippe mentioned, uh, that the, the crypto assets are, are, are very sort of cross-jurisdictional in nature, uh, which raises some very interesting challenges for us in the FCA as regulators about our approach uh, in terms of territorial, ter territorial application of both our perimeter and indeed our, 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 our regulatory requirements that we're still we're still working through and I think we're still grappling with. Um, so yeah, look, it's going to be a really interesting few years uh, in terms of regulation of, of crypto assets. I, I personally think these things are not going away. They will change, they will adapt over time. Um, but and, and the regulation needs to be flexible enough to be able to uh, 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 cope with that. Um, but it's it, it's it's a fascinating fascinating area as a practitioner to, uh, uh, to 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 be working on. It, it can be a bit scary at times when you sort of think about uh, the, the types of risks that are involved and the types of products that you see. Um, but it's it, it, it's very interesting. And look, I mean, I think uh, um, you know, uh, we've, I think we just got to recognise that these things we can't wish them away. They are there. They're they're becoming a lot more mainstream, uh, and we will have to have. I think an effective, uh, an innovative form of regulation to be to be able to deal with them. That 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 doesn't just apply to the UK; it applies to the EU and indeed Australia or anywhere else in the world, for that matter. Thank you, thank you, Nick, uh, for your reflections. Um, Nick also came to speak to my students who are doing the regulation of financial markets course um, earlier in the academic year, and and we did reflect on this issue of perimeter. And and for me, I think I mean I I do understand that this is a a, a big philosophy, you know, where where our regulation is concerned. But um, for the layman out there who's looking for kind of fin financial services protection and for the purposes of financial education, that the perimeter issue is not really very easily explained to them in terms of why it is that certain activities are, are not overseen, are not overseen in the same way uh, by the FCA uh, and, and perhaps the Bank of England as well, where we look at you know, kind of systemic importance. So I think that sort of bridging society with, with regulators is, is still possibly a work in progress, you know, where, where we are concerned. Um, so I guess, I mean, if, if everyone would indulge my, my kind of five minutes of uh, advertisement. I mean, I've, I've also written a, a book on regulating the crypto economy uh, that was published um, uh, earlier this year. So, so this is this is how it looks. Um, yeah. And, um, and, and 
basically, I think I have I have taken an approach that looks at um, kind of the business and commercial value of uh, blockchain based or distributed ledger based businesses, those that are hosted on permissionless blockchains. Um, and, and I think the financing needs actually come from the enterprisal needs. And which is why, I mean, the book proposes that the first thing that ought to be done is to be looking at how to enable some of these enterprises to really be mobilized and contribute to economic development. Um, and so the, the missing question in Mika, which is the, the, the DAO question, or how do you treat blockchain-based organizations, enterprises, I thought is actually central. Um, and this is the reason why I really like the uh, Senate committee uh, in, in, in Australia's proposal that, that they include this and they see this as an indispensable part you know, of, of the agenda and the debate. And, and that, you know, I, I agree. I think in terms of um, the EU, Malta is probably the first that has come up with uh, that a new piece of legislation of recognizing this sort of uh, distributed ledger base, you know, kind of loosely called organization. Um, and I think that there is some scope for us to think about whether these sorts of uh, enabling pieces of legislation will be useful, you know, for the economy. Uh, obviously in the EU, the challenge of uh, harmonizing company law, you know, you know, would be would be quite forefront, um, but it, it is it is something that um, I think really ought to be a starting point because it's only if you have useful you know um, new forms of socially useful businesses that we start thinking about how to finance them um, and uh, how to financialize them you know at the same time. Um, so the proposals in the book, you know, that deal with financial regulation are, are kind of in that vein and wrapped around the enterprisal value. Uh, of these businesses. And I really hope that, you know, the attention comes back to look at the novelties and the new social value or utility that's added, you know, by, by some of these businesses. They're not just, you know, decentralized finance or NFTs. And, and there are lots of other types of businesses in terms of peer-to-peer -peer services, uh, as well as gaming. And I think, you know, some, some of us more, you know, non-gaming folk would not really understand how the gaming worlds work. And because I think my son is a gamer, I, I've, I've got a lot more insight into, into the sort of alternative universes and, and the very big um, commercial as well as social space in, in the gaming world. I think this is something that we, we need to uh, kind of turn our attention to and properly recognize uh, and, and not merely focus on conventional forms or activities or structures uh, in the economy. So that's my, my five minutes worth. Um, and, and also to bring it back to, to kind of whether a holistic, you know, uh, agenda for reform is, is better. I, I don't think I have any easy answer to um, what Andrew has, has, you know, kind of uh, fleshed out in relation to the unitary, you know, versus the bespoke um, approach to financial regulation. I think, I think that's a very difficult one. And in the, in the UK, I distinctly remember that we, when we had the FSA, you know, we, we did talk overtly about um, embracing a functional approach to financial services regulation. But the definition of financial services is still really quite piecemeal and patchwork. You know, in, in terms of our regulated activities order, our schedule of activities, and there is a very sense of you know, sectoral path dependence compared to the sort of definition that, that Andrew pulled up you know, from the Corporations Act, that, that's truly trying to be you know, very functional, very cross-cutting in nature. And I think we are, we are still not there. I, I'm not sure whether that is the best way forward in the sense of um, whether that will be timeless and, and really all-inclusive, meaningfully inclusive, uh, or, or whether the sort of patchwork approach, but patchwork in an intelligent way, meaning that you can have a patchwork and bespoke approach, but not fail to recognize when things need to be joined up in terms of interagency thinking or in terms of just being able to be joined up with existing regimes and, and, and articulating clearly where the differences are and where the similarities are. So the, the kind of dynamic, I think, in terms of uh, going bespoke and then um, going back from bespoke to integration would be a very dynamic process, which I think should be continued and, and we shouldn't um, disavow any of the approaches. I think both approaches you know, are, are valid and we could probably have shades of hybrid you know, in between. Um, 
in, in terms of what technology throws at us and, and how you know, these different forms of financial services would, would evolve. So, so that's, that's kind of my, my thinking, um, you know, after hearing from everyone and, and kind of reflecting on the different types of approaches that are being taken. Um, but I do hope to see something more joined up and holistic, I think, I mean, in, in the UK. Uh, there, there is, of course, you know, the benefit of waiting to see what other people do and seeing if they fail or succeed. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, to be to be completely behind the curve is is also not, you know, terribly ideal. Right. Um, I'm just wondering if there is any, you know, question from the audience. Please feel free to type your questions into the Q and A box, um, and I'll be monitoring uh, the box. Um, maybe as the questions come in. Um, Amongst us as, as panelists, we might have questions for each other. I'm just wondering if uh, any one of us has a burning question for, for you know, any other and, and might want to raise it at this moment. Uh, yes, Andrew. Andrew, you might want to unmute. Here we go, it worked. I came face to face with the same uh, message that Nick and I think Philip had come across before, namely, uh, we weren't able to unmute ourselves. But um, really interesting, Iris. Uh, one thought that came to my mind is the um, issue of regulatory flexibility and discretion and um, to what extent the power to uh, declare that something is within the perimeter should be in, in the remit of the regulator. Um, if I understand both Philip and Nick correctly, in the EU, um, you, you're, you're stuck with these definitions now and the regulator can't actually adjust or amend or refine the definitions. Um, and similarly, Nick, in the, in the UK, the FCA doesn't have the power to um, identify a new uh, activity for that purpose. It's all based on statute. Similarly, in Australia, um, ASIC can't do that, but what it can do, interestingly, is determine if something isn't a financial product. So it has the power to exempt or exclude something from the regulatory perimeter. And that perhaps is a, is a product of the functional approach where everything's in, if you like, unless it's... Um, declared to be out by the regulator. But um, I do wonder to what extent we need to invest regulators with greater discretion and power in this regard, because um, it's just so difficult to deal with these different uh, demarcations or changing demarcations between various um, activities and different types of asset. And uh, Philip, you mentioned DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, and of course, you have different versions of that, so it's not homogenous itself. Um, you've got some that are governed by the members, others that are governed purely by algorithm. And so that creates even greater challenges in terms of working out how it should be fitted into the existing regime, whether it operates similar to a company or whether it's, it's more like some other type of entity. But I see Nick has his hand up and I'll... Uh, Sure. I'll let you come in, Nick, and, and share with us any thoughts you have. Sure. No, it's, that's 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 really really interesting, Andrew. Um, I mean, one 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 comment from me on that is obviously also because in the UK and I suppose in Australia too, and indeed the EU, our perimeters are kind of set by legislation. Of course, courts interpret them as well. Mm. That, that's mm. That, that, that's the other thing, and you never really know where a court is going to come out. I mean, regulatory perimeter cases that come in front of the courts are relatively unusual in the UK. There are quite a few case authorities in collective investment scheme, for instance, but not really much on other aspects of the perimeter. But you can kind of see as these things start to get litigated a bit more, you know, the courts will come with their own interpretations, actually. And that's something, something to bear in mind. That's quite difficult for a regulator to control. Yes, we can make representations to the court, but at the end of the day, a judge is going to make a decision as to uh, where they see the perimeter lying. Right, I have one question on the Q&A uh, and uh, someone has asked whether Mika will cover decentralized finance. Shall I, shall I defer to Philip uh, to answer this? 
Yes, thank you. Um, uh, well, decentralized finance again is like 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 a big bag of of different concepts uh, overlapping. But um, the answer is actually no, it does not. At least not specifically. Yeah. Because so Mika really takes the approach. Okay, do we have a token that falls within the, the definition? And if it's not then it's not under Mika. However, certain practices um, that are covered by some aspects of decentralized finance might fall under the existing regulation, the MIFID. Not all of them, but some of them. Yeah? Um, so I actually have some, some practitioner friends who are currently tailoring, uh, trying to get authorization from the German regulator, like, oh, does it fall to this or that category? So, um, so Mika doesn't apply, but the existing uh, regulation might or the directives and the corresponding bonding national regulation but which is actually a funny example or funny funny result if you think about it you have this new mika thing but then the arguably even more advanced DeFi is then uh, may be covered by the more conservative traditional regulation that builds on concepts that are like 20 or 30 years old you know? the 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 crypto universe is full of surprises Yes, thank you, Philip. And, and I mean, to, to just to quickly add to that, I also think that Mika has um, focused a lot on the asset side of things. And and as Philip has rightly said, I think, I mean, fa Facebook's GM project was really one of the, the most crystallizing things, you know, for this endeavor. But um, what we now see is not just asset based you know uh, issues but but rather transformations with regard to services and financial intermediation um, and service providers are not hugely provided for in Mika. I mean Mika's regulation of service providers is quite vague except uh, re with regard to the centralized you know cryptocurrency exchange where we have a few more provisions I mean other service providers have you know, vaguer obligations attached to them, although we could say they come from some of the best practices in MIFID. But whether, you know, this includes all of the specific types of risks that people are really concerned about, uh, not really. So it, it could well be possible that um, Mika will have to fix this, you know, before the finalized text, or we might see, uh, you know, bits of the finalized text referring to uh, different types of services. Yes, Philip. Yes, maybe to add, and we should not forget that, um, or we should not treat the the crypto universe as something distinct or disparate from just from from the rest. Because and what we see is that a lot of the let's say conventional traditional financial service provider are moving into this space, and we're, we're talking about licensing requirements and this and that and that. They are usually already subject to these things, so um, so very often it's not a real issue in practice. It's more more interesting if you really have completely new approaches to these things, uh, like in a, in a DAO or something like that, if it's just that and nothing else, then these questions about Mika get really relevant, yes. Right, Look, looks like um, our audience is um, very satisfied with uh, the intellectual food that we have uh, fed them. <laughs> I don't see any other open questions uh, except for uh, the DeFi question, yes, which which remains you know, really quite open. I don't, don't think we can satisfactorily answer this here. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any final thoughts from any of our panelists before I call the session to a close. Any, anything that any one of us you know, wants to say and, and we have kind of burning well, message. No. One uh, interesting question, Iris, is to what extent we'll eventually see harmonisation or convergence in this area. I know um, harmonisation or convergence internationally is a difficult uh, objective to obtain, partly because it's um, easy to agree, to agree on the outcomes, but not so easy to agree on how those outcomes might be achieved. And we do all have different systems and different philosophies. Um, but I think increasingly there'll be a need to strengthen cross-border regulatory coordination. And I know the UK has been, been very active in that regard, Nick, um, with its GFIN initiative and um, recognition of the need for regulators to share information, particularly in areas like FinTech and RegTech, and to um, uh, deal with the cross-border challenges that arise when you, when, when you have these virtual assets and it's very difficult often to know where they are issued or in which markets they may have been traded. And so one does wonder whether some sort of supranational um, infrastructure might emerge at some point in the future. Um, perhaps that requires an algorithm to design rather than 
uh, as something that we mere humans might be able to design. But I think that's going to become increasingly important, particularly as it as it turns out, um, as it becomes difficult to identify where assets exist and where they are issued and so on and so forth. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Andrew. Philip, you wanted to add something. Yes, I think it's quite interesting that both Andrew and Nick both mentioned regulators, regulators and regulatory approaches and styles, and I think we'll need to put much more emphasis on that. And we also need, and I hope that politicians and policymakers actually discover this topic all of a sudden, because a lot of things, Nick, that the FCA is able to do by law, the German regulator cannot for various reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I think we will have much more reliance on saying, for example, oh, what the regulator in Singapore in, or in London is doing, that's fine. We simply accept that result because I think otherwise this whole patchwork will not, I mean we're talking about Mika and 27 member states but that's still a very small corner of the world right it will be interesting right. right thank you thank you Philip um does Nick want to add anything no, actually, I mean, I think it's been a it's been a great session. Actually, it's been really, really interesting to hear, uh, you know, about the Australian and, and, and Mika, and and hear hear the thoughts of Andrew, uh, yourself, and Philip. Right. Thank you. I think maybe just just one final word, if, if people would indulge me. I, I I really like Andrew's question on on whether or not we'll have an, a conversion approach. I think if we look at you know kind of securities law, uh, we we've never had a conversion approach because because of, of the, the interest of regulatory competition. So I think maybe regulatory competition is, is, you know, is the lens through which we can see whether or not we'll get an internationally mm. convergent approach. I think if we have a common harm that we all want to weed out, you know, AML, for example, we, we've had a good conversion approach in that area of financial regulation. But um, where crypto assets are concerned, I think different jurisdictions see different things, you know, in terms of opportunities, you know, versus consumer harms and, and, and and, and you know so on and i think that different landscape you know in terms of what each jurisdiction perceives to be its business opportunities or its needs to protect uh, uh, citizens would probably dictate and, and shape the sort of uh, regulatory agenda ahead and then that will probably lead to divergence so i i think maybe you know i i would guess likely not in terms of a, a, an internationally convergent approach, even if um, such things are very mobile and, and global in nature and, and borderless. And it, it's really the interest that we maintain, I think territorially, uh, that, that would still militate against this. But I, I would love to see a different approach. <laughs> right. So it remains for me to thank uh, my panelists uh, for giving of their time and for giving their views and their reflections uh, on uh, this, this very interesting and ongoing topic. And thank you, my audience, for being here uh, and staying with us to the end. Uh, and, and thank you all uh, once again uh, for being part of this panel and uh, making this uh, um, a bang of a way to finish uh, our academic year uh, at uh, the UCL Center for Ethics and Law. So thank you again. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to all of you from London.